We are very excited and honored to have University of Michigan alumna Jill Bordy deliver our keynote lecture, which she has titled, Found in Translation, My Life Thanks to the University of Michigan. Jill first began studying Russian language as a teenager. At Michigan, she studied Slavic languages and literatures before starting her first job as a Russian language broadcaster for Voice of America in Washington, D.C. After moving from radio to television, Jill joined CNN and served in many roles at the network, including managing editor of CNN International Asia Pacific in Hong Kong, Moscow bureau chief, and White House correspondent. She covered the 1991 coup attempt in Moscow, Georgia's Rose Revolution, Ukraine's Orange Revolution, and the presidencies of Boris Yeltsin and Vladimir Putin, as well as other major events. She was also part of the team that won the American Journalism Review's Award for Best White House Coverage in 1993. She traveled widely with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and has reported from more than 50 countries around the world. Jill recently earned her master's degree at Georgetown and was an international policy fellow at the Wilson Center. With such a diverse and fascinating career, Jill's path after Michigan demonstrates the many doors that an international education can open. She has turned her passion into a rewarding career and is inspirational to all of us, both as faculty and as students. Please join me in welcoming Jill Doherty back to the University of Michigan. Thank you so much. All right. Now, let's see if I can, um, I don't have a degree in engineering, so we will hope that some of these, pictures, these are just really, um, what I wanted to do was just kind of illustrate, so that you won't fall asleep, uh, a little bit of my history and that, you know, what happened as a result of studying Russian and being at the University of Michigan. So these are pictures I've taken over the years, and I love taking pictures. So um, they, uh, some will have something to do with what I say, and some may not, but I'll try to, I'll try to bring it together. You know, I was, I was really glad to be here for the entire day. Can everyone hear pretty well? I was very glad to be here for the entire day because it's really opened my eyes to the meaning to me of being at Michigan. Um, I began to think, in fact, I wrote, I have this line in here, that it was kind of serendipitous the way my career developed. And, you know, in a way it was. A lot of it, I just kind of stumbled to the next thing. Um, but to be fair, I followed things that I was interested in and liked and avoided things that I hated. And that kind of led me down the path to do what I really do love. Um, but in that, and maybe we'll talk about this later because I do want to have questions, um, I see that the serendipity that seemed like serendipity at the time was really, if you were to look at my life as a kid, um, when I was a teenager studying Russian, there was a structure in place that was the U.S. government putting money into the study of foreign languages. There were dedicated teachers who were watching over me, and I have a twin sister, Pam. I'll show you her picture soon. And uh, who were really putting this structure in place that I kind of um, bounced through thinking that it, I, I was kind of doing it myself, but I actually wasn't, you know? There were people who were guiding me, and there was a direction that helped me because I really got turned on about the Russian language. So starting at the beginning, you know, I'm so used to doing, if I'm in front of a micro, uh, microphone, I'm so used to doing live shots where they say, rap, rap, you know, keep it short, keep it short. So now it's kind of a privilege to be able to talk. So I'm just going to talk a little bit. I'm thinking, I will look at my watch here, I'll talk for, um, let's say, a half an hour, 35 minutes or something, and then we can have a, a discussion, if that works for you. So, um, Russia, you know, the place, this is St. Petersburg, these, as I said, are pictures I've taken along the way, but um, this is from the top of St. Isaac's Cathedral <laughs> on this very, I do not like heights, so I risk my sanity to take this picture. But, you know, um, going to St. Petersburg and, and when I was relatively young, but also being exposed to the Russian language, I think is why I 
got the career that I did. And it started back in, of all places, Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, 1963. Uh, I have a twin sister, I think her, there she is, Pam. And we're not identical, but we, um, we both decided, we went to a public high school in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which was very advanced at that time. And they had majors, so you had to take a major in high school. So it was either math or languages. And since I cannot do math, and I'm not exaggerating, I cannot do math, but I love languages. That was an easy choice. And then if you were a language major, then you had to take a classical uh, language or a modern foreign language. So I took Latin, and then a lot of people studied Spanish, a lot of people studied French, et cetera. They had German and they had Russian. And Pam and I both decided that we would study Russian. And that, that was kind of a fluke. But I, as I look back at it, you know, why did we decide to do it? Well, it was exotic, number one. And I, there, if there was one thing at that point in my life that I wanted to be, I did not want to be an average American girl. I, wanted, I really did have the sense of adventure. I used to create, the, I, I would go, you get a lot of snow in Pennsylvania. I would, went exploring, and I was always literally exploring, you know, making trouble for myself so that I would have to overcome odds to get to the end. And that is what I, I think I was just born that way. So why did we study Russian? Well, oh, let me go back. That's a surprise. I'll go back here. Um, we studied Russian. I think one was, it was the Cold War. The uh, Sputnik satellite had been launched just about seven years before we started studying Russian. And if you, you obviously, most of you don't remember that, but that was a period where the United States really decided that we were behind the eight ball, that the Soviet Union was way uh, ahead of us in terms of technological advance, and that meant that we had to have a space race, and we also had to study critical foreign languages. So there was that the general society, which is very worried about the Soviets uh, succeeding, and then um, there was also at that point, my father was an FBI agent. He was a special, um, special agent of the FBI. And uh, it's, it, it was funny, but I, I think that was part of it. Know the enemy type of approach to life because of the FBI. Then there was um, that phrase that we had at that point, optimist study Russian, pessimist study Chinese which seems kind of funny. I think I'd almost reverse it at this point. But um, that was one. And then finally, I think it was you know, the intellectual challenge of studying a language. And my father had a very, very strong influence on me. And he uh, fought in World War II. He was in the Pacific Theater. And he was in marine intelligence. And he uh, was in the Philippines. And then toward the end of the war, he ended up in China. And he came back with a, you know, boxes of black and white photographs of China. And I would look at these photographs and look at pictures of like little kids and the Great Wall and then aerial reconnaissance photos. I mean, I was addicted to The World at War, which was um, a very interesting documentary series. And I was really, I, I don't know what, I was not your average little kid, I guess, but I was very addicted to that. And as I looked at these pictures, I thought, oh, wow, there's this country that's called China. And there are these little kids running around. And they, well, I wonder what their life is like. And my father would tell me some stories. And then also, there would be, um, you know, kind of a, that they would speak a different language. I actually did not understand what a language was. I didn't understand at that point. But later, when I went into high school, I understood the concept of languages. And it intrigued me very, very much. The idea that when you speak a foreign language, you think differently, you act differently, and I think you, you interact with people in a different way. And you can do things in a different language that you can't do in your native language. That was, to me, very, very interesting. So we uh, chose Russian. I won't belabor the point, but Mr. Peregrine, who is here, 
person entered my life. That is Mr. Michael Peregrine. This picture was taken a week ago. And I went back to Scranton, Pennsylvania for an event. And Mr. Peregrine, who is now 78 years old, uh, and I said, Mr. Peregrine, I have to do an interview with you. So I sat down and we talked about this period. We talked about the Cold War and his experiences. And he also benefited at that time from the Cold War and what the US government was doing. He was a native Russian speaker. His family had come from Russia uh, after World War II, but, um, it, which was not that far you know, removed. But he, and he knew Russian, it was his native language, as I said, but he didn't really um, know how to teach Russian. He was a teacher, but he was a French teacher. So he was able to go to Indiana University, which was another center, you know, of knowledge about Russia, and uh, took courses and then came back and started teaching Russian. So I owe him a, an enormous debt. And one reason that I owe him an enormous debt is because in our class, or in our Russian classes, in the beginning there were like, I think there were 20 some students, which was amazing. Then it went down to 18 in the second year. Then it went down, oh, I'm sorry, to 12. Then it went down to six. And the last year, it was Pam and I left alone. And he said, you know, girls, we can't give a class for fewer than six kids. But if you really want to work hard, and we're, you know, we're very eager, and he said, if you want to work very, very hard, I will give you my free period, and we will study Russian. And there wasn't even a classroom. So he set up a table in an auditorium, and we sat in the chairs in the auditorium, and he taught us every single day in his free period. When he could have been taking a smoke, at that point, you'd probably smoke in those days, and or have a cup of coffee and relax. And he gave his time to us. So Pam and I went streaking through Russian. It was just like, you know, we had this person who was our tutor. And uh, we would go home. And my parents, I have no Russian blood at all. And we would go home and speak Russian to each other. And our parents couldn't understand, which was kind of the reverse. You know, the usually the parents speak it and the kids can't understand, but we would speak it. So again, I'm very, very uh, grateful to him. Um, now, uh, Pam and I, I do, before I leave high school, I do, because this is one of the, the um, important, oops, well, OK, I'll leave that up. That's Michigan. That was also a picture I took in Moscow. And we'll put that up because it's inspiration. But Pam and I in high school, um, we're convinced that Mr. Peregrine didn't speak any, any English because, indeed, his class began in Russian, you know, что это? Это стол, это стул, and he never spoke any English. And so we were convinced. I mean, I thought, I, I just was petrified because I thought there's no way I'm going to survive. But it was complete immersion. And as we got more comfortable, Pam and I decided this one day, Mr. Peregrine was, of course, the only Russian teacher. He got sick, and there was a substitute teacher who was a German teacher. And she came to class, and we decided that we were going to pull a prank. We got, I can still remember his name, David Hollenberg, our friend, who was our Russian interpreter. And he was going to introduce this teacher, or introduce us, the Russian exchange students to this German teacher. So he brought us into the class. And I thought within five minutes, she's going to realize this is completely insane. These girls are not Russian exchange students. So she said, um, oh, how delightful to meet you. And we said, oh, how do you do? You know, kind of a Russian accent. And then David started interpreting. And then she just continued to believe that we were Russian exchange students. And she said, she finally, I said, no, don't understand. And she said, how long you in America? <laughs> so it was very embarrassing. And we were whisked out of class eventually to the principal's office, who probably got a big laugh. But we were punished severely by writing German words on the blackboard for a long time. But in any case, so we survived. Now. Um, 
So let me uh, move it forward because, again, I want to, I want to get some questions. But we transferred to Michigan in, uh, we went to a, a women's Catholic college in Boston, majored in Russian. And because we had so much Russian in high school and advanced placement classes, et cetera, we went into the third year. So by the, our, fresh, our sophomore year, we had essentially, unfortunately, run out of Russian classes. So we thought, where do we go? And we decided, of course, to come to Michigan. And that, somebody mentioned before that, you know, Michigan at that point for me was the epicenter of Russian studies. And it really was. When I think back of the teachers, we were talking about Asya Humeska, who wrote one of the most incredible um, books on the Russian language, a textbook that you can imagine. And there was it also mentioned Carl Proffer and Elendea Proffer with Artist Press slightly behind, after us because we ended up being here from, all, well, all of 69, I think we came in 68, and then all of 69 and 70 up to the middle of 70, and then we graduated early. But it was the place that all of a sudden I realized the depth of knowledge in a way that I really hadn't. I think it took a little maturing on my part, but to understand that there were people here who not only were from Russia, Poland, and other places, but had a depth of knowledge in literature and the language that was really um, mind-boggling for me. I was deeply inspired by people who would give their lives to knowledge. And I still am, I just love studying. I love learning things. And here, I could just learn just for the fun of it almost. We lived in a Russian dorm. I don't know whether that still exists. It was on North Campus, but there was a Russian dorm. It was called the Russian House. And we, of course, had black bread and vodka. But we also talked Russian to each other all the time. It was all these Russian students. And it was great. You know, we just kind of, again, were immersed in it. And at that point, um, I'll show you one picture, too. Well, that's kind of, that actually was taken not long ago in St. Petersburg, kind of Soviet retro, which continues to be, I think, a theme in Russia that maybe we could talk about later. But this statue, you know, that's Joseph Brodsky, the poet, who came to the University of Michigan. I believe it was 71. Maybe, Pauline, you can, somebody can correct me on that. But I think it was 71, um, one of the most uh, incredibly wonderful modern poets of Russia. This statue was put up, and I really like it because, you know, he's looking at the sky, and it has a very different feeling. It's right in a park that's almost across from the American Embassy in Moscow. So every time I go by it, I think of that, and I think of, of Michigan. Um, but it was, it was a place where you could meet people who were, um, as I said, not only from Russia, but deeply, deeply knew it. And that period of study, we got some scholarships along the way. But what we did get, and that, again, I thank the US government for a lot of this, was the ability to study in Leningrad thanks to a National Defense Foreign Language Fellowship. NDFL, which was, the, I believe, the precursor to Title VI, which now, of course, is in jeopardy because nobody seems to understand the importance of that, which we can get into also later, one of my pet subjects. But that plus CIEE, which was mentioned by one of the students here, I believe, Council on International Educational Exchange, meant that we could study in St. Petersburg, Leningrad at the time. This is the old part of the university, um, classic buildings. And there, too, it was a depth of knowledge about language and linguistics that I was so helpful in being able to speak really, really good Russian. Um, there were, I thought oh, it was Nan who mentioned CIEE. Um, there was uh, another student at that school at the time, although our paths did not cross. They crossed much later. But, um, the, oh, this is our dorm. I should mention, you know, every time I go back, and I go back to Russia pretty frequently, 
I was in uh, St. Petersburg not too long ago. I guess this is probably, probably a year and a half to two years ago. And this is the old dorm, so I thought, I have to go back to the old dorm to see how it is. So it has been restored and renovated by some rich Russians, and I couldn't figure out how to get into it. We didn't have, we hardly had hot water. Uh, we ended up going to the banya all the time. But there is the dormitory. They have this ship, which is really just a replica, is now a restaurant um, in front of our old dorm. So it's very snazzy. In those days, it was not very snazzy. And, but we, this is the view that we had looking across the Neva River to the Hermitage. So now, in this summer, in August, Council on International Educational Exchange is having the 50th anniversary of the exchanges with Leningrad, St. Petersburg. So I'm going to go back. I was contacted out of the blue by Leningrad State University. And I'm going to go back for that reunion because 50 years for that program should be quite amazing. I'm really looking forward to that. So at that university, you may recognize his eyes. There was another student who is Vladimir Putin, who was a budding KGB agent who was getting a law degree at that point at Leningrad State University. Again, I never met him, but later I would meet him uh, quite a lot. Um, so ba Pam and I graduated, and um, Pam went on, by the way, to get a PhD in linguistics, in Slavic linguistics. She wrote her, uh, she was doing it at the University of Vienna in Austria, and she wrote her dissertation in German on Slavic linguistics. So Pam is pretty much the brain in the family. And she you know, went on. She actually did not pursue an academic career, though. She got into business um, with Eli Lilly, the pharmaceutical company, and began trading. And she never came back. She never came back to the States. I see her occasionally. Um, but basically, she's lived in Europe for a long time. Another thing that was happening at that point was, oh dear, that's, well, this is early, early days. At that point, let me move away from this quickly. Oh dear, there's another picture of him. Let's leave that up. While <laughs> the, the other thing that was, I love this. There's so many pictures around Moscow and, and um, depictions of President Putin. And I love this savior of the world. Uh, it gives you an idea of how he's looked upon by some people. But there were exchanges also. This is why I think programs were very important. At that time, Pam and I went on exchanges uh, organized by the US Information Agency. And we would go around the Soviet Union, set up the exhibit. People would come in, thousands of Russians. And we had a theme, like the first one I went on was Research and Development USA. So it was spin-offs from the, the uh, space program. And we had things like robotic arms. It was very cutting edge. Of course, this is like 1970, 1971. Um, but at that point, it was very cutting edge. Russians were very interested, but they were more interested in the Americans. And so they would ask us all about our, our personal lives. They were convinced that the US government, if only, had uh, all of our teeth done, because at that point, you know, Russians had very bad dentistry, and they, would, they actually said, did the government you know, fix your teeth so you could look nice on the exhibit? It was very touching, but I got a, a real eye-opening experience in understanding Russians and their mentality. They, they revealed very much by the questions that they would ask you know, about, um, their, that's in front of my old dorm, about Russia, about, about the United States, about our families. And not to tell too many war stories, but um, Pam and I were on this exhibit. We both decided we were going to try out for that. And on the exhibit, there were KGB agents at that point who were provocateurs, who would ask embarrassing questions about you know, race relations, um, Vietnam War, something like that. And this one woman came up, and she was obviously KGB, you could just tell, kind of like this tough woman. And she kept saying, 
what does your father do? What does your mother do? Where do you live? How many kids are in your family? And I just answered. This is very common that you would get questions, but she was just kind of, you know, hammering. And then at the end of it, if you speak Russian, some of you, I'm sure, she said, Vryosh, you know, you're lying. And I said, lying, Vryosh, you know, why? And she said, well, there's another girl on this exhibit who said there are six kids in her family, and they live in Worcester, Massachusetts, and, you know, their father X, et cetera. And um, I said, well, that, my dear lady, is because that's my twin sister. And you can see that the Russians at that point you know, wanted to learn about the United States, wanted to learn about personal stories. And I really believe that, you know, we have this debate now going on about propaganda. How do you answer Russian propaganda? And should we do the thing, same things they're doing? And my argument would be no, we shouldn't do propaganda. And we should also kind of calm down about how we really answer it. Um, this is much broader than I want to talk about right now, but I think there is a type of personal communication with people that can transcend a lot of this. There are a lot of Russians who really do, in spite of everything, like the United States and are intrigued even by our chaotic democracy at this point. There are Russians who are drawing counterintuitive messages from the chaos that we have, let's say, during the election. I mean, right now, we do have, I would say, political chaos. And you could say, OK, score one for Russian propaganda, because they can say, oh, look at American democracy. It doesn't work. They can't even pull it together. Would you ever want to live with American-style democracy? But there are other Russians who look at it and say, oh, there's a choice. You know, the man that we didn't expect would win one. Now, how do you explain that? Was it engineered by the government? Probably not. So there, you know, I think propaganda is, and especially today, is very different. So we should not approach it the way, you know, we approached it in those days. Um, I, my first job was at the Voice of America, uh, broadcasting in Russian, um, and getting, um, you know, feedback from some of the listeners. And I do see, I did not consider that, at the point that I was doing it, propaganda. It was book reviews, music, et cetera. And that, again, that personal communication. Years later, I would go back um, and meet people, and they would remember Voice of America because of the music, because of you know, cultural programs. And they would remember the exhibits. They would even keep the little znachki that you would wear on the exhibit years later, like. 20 years later, because they had that human communication. So, you know, fast forward, um, I went from Voice of America, I was there for, uh, I think it was six years, and then um, I got into TV, and then early into CNN, three years af after it was founded. And that's really where I made my career. And uh, the, the thing that I liked, and what I learned at Michigan, and then kind of translated to that job was Ted Turner, who is one of my heroes, kind of an amazingly um, crazy guy, but he, is, he was a genius at inventing 24-hour news. And he considered CNN and its correspondents citizens of the world, and I don't say that lightly, that we were to be, we were not to think of ourselves as Americans, and I never did. I always tried to put myself in the place of somebody you know, from any country who would try to understand what was going on in the United States. And that served me very well. And it's very much in keeping, I think, what we heard from the students and from the previous panels of people who you know, have this worldview that Michigan has uh, inculcated in us. So it was, it was really useful. Um, as I continued, beautiful Leningrad again, this is one I threw in. Just I continue to be mesmerized by Russia, probably captured by the Russian bear. So I put that out. But now we have you know, the modern Russia. This is a picture I took just about, I don't know, half a year ago. Um, and this is, you may not, some of you may not even recognize. This is, I am at the Ukraine Hotel. For those of you who remember the Ukraine Hotel, 
looking at what's called city, city. And it is a completely modern, almost like Dubai looking section of Moscow that they want to, you know, it's a symbol of Russia, Renaissance Russia. And it's a lot of very, very modern buildings from there. This is, it's a different country. Um, it is a, the people, you know, young people are different. And when I was there, well, this is some, I continue to do live shots for CNN. And a couple of months, let's see, it would be in October, November, I was back for CNN, and I wanted to get a little bit of flavor. There was a lot on Russian hacking, and we were very, very busy. This is Moscow State University. And I decided to run up there. It's a, a, you know, really the best university in Russia. Run up there and just talk to people. We had no idea what we were going to find. It was snowing. At that point, it was not. But five minutes later, it was a downpour of snow. And I stood there, and I talked with these Russian students. And here they are. And they're all like, you know, my age, when I was here at Michigan, walking across the Diag. And, you know, talking with them. And I was trying to figure out, OK, where are they going to go? These are the creme de la creme. These are like the students at the University of Michigan, you know, who will go out and do incredible things and, become, and change the world. These are the kids who will change the world in Russia. And it was interesting. You know, they're um, very proud of being Russian. And yet there's a pull toward Europe. And they're compatriots of young people around the world who are watching the same things and who are sometimes listening to the same music, um, doing the same kind of funny, mocking things on the web that you know, our young people do. And one kid that I talked to, I shouldn't call them kids, but they felt kind of like kids because I was a kid at that point, um, was really kind of a true believer. You know, he, he, I said, so what are you going to do? Where do you want to study? Or he wanted to go to grad school. Europe, no, I want to stay here in Russia. Um, and we started talking. And there is a mood among many of them that they're not really part of Europe, that they're separate, they're different. And this, I think, can you could say it's good, maybe, because they're proud of Russia. And I think it's time that people are proud, that they're not embarrassed or feel that their country was demeaned after the end of the Soviet Union. But I think we, we have to not let those young people get cut off from us. And that's why exchanges and anything that can bring young people together and students together, to my mind, is very, very important, whether they come here or we go there. We have to communicate. My knowledge that I learned from Russia and that started here, you know, I met a lot of international students from a variety of countries. Most of my friends here at Michigan weren't, oddly enough, not Americans. They were almost all foreigners. And they became lifelong friends around the world. We can't let that end because that is going to be the key to the future of our country. I firmly believe that we cannot pe keep people out. I'm not trying to be political. I'm just saying that that, to me, is very short-sighted, that we have to send our, our young people all around the world. And as many young people from other countries have to come here, it's all, it really is all one world. And that's, I think, what Michigan, Michigan gave to me is, as I, I think, you know, Mark was mentioning this, you get a grounding and you get kind of the tools that allow you to adapt to a changing world. You know, I left CNN about, after I got my master's. I was working at the State Department, covering the State Department, and Hillary Clinton was traveling around the world. And she was literally doing like a million miles around the world. And I had no free time. But I thought, you know, I just, I really want to get back. I really want to get my master's. And just for the fun of it, I just really wanted to go back, get my brain in gear, and study. And then in the back of my mind, I thought, it'll be helpful in the future 
if I wanted to teach, which I eventually ended up doing a little bit of just a month ago. And so, you know, studying and then use, being exposed to a new life, I was very afraid, especially at my age. Like, what am I going to do? 30 years with CNN? All I can do is talk in front of a microphone. You know, ah, what if I stop doing that? How am I defined? How do I define myself outside of CNN? And then I had this education that I'd gotten at Michigan, which I've been intensely proud of around the world. You know, meet it like in Moscow, I would meet, you know, businessmen who had gone to the University of Michigan. And it's very prestigious, as you all know. And then I had that experience thanks to the US government. And then I had the experience, the life experience. And I thought, maybe I can do this, maybe I can do this. And so I just kind of said goodbye to CNN. It was very friendly, went off. And then all of these things started happening. I got a fellowship at Harvard. I became a fellow at the Wilson Center. I did research on Russian media and propaganda. Then I started writing stuff. Then I was asked to teach at the University of Washington in Seattle, where I live. Then now I go to more conferences than I can even imagine talk about Russia, interact with Russians. And just this past week, um, I was in DC for a group that's called the Dartmouth Group, so a group that was founded during the depths of the Cold War, a track two, as we call it, mostly you know, officials, a lot of people from the State Department, um, who get together and talk about how can you bring this relationship back on track, and then give advice or recommendations to our governments. So. Um, I never would have imagined that that could happen. But the tools that I got here allowed me to, to do that, to know that somehow I kind of knew what I was talking about, which always helps, and that maybe things would evolve in a great way. So I was very grateful for that. And you know, this is another picture I took at night in Moscow, and just thinking this country that continues to intrigue me. I think I understand it, but I never will completely. Um, but that intellectual excitement that I gave free reign to here at Michigan and how I was guided in my path, as I said, by people who taught me, my high school teacher who gave me my free period, the professors here at Michigan who went the extra mile and who, had, who could really bring literature and language to life. All of that was there. And I think it's very important, you know, in my life now that we preserve that for people that I see out in the audience. Because, you know, I mean, I was walking on the Diag. It felt like yesterday, but I was walking across the Diag a few years ago. And, in, and you will be too, you know, except you will have accomplished something in your lives. You'll have careers, and you will have to change. And we were talking about this. You probably have, what was it, six careers? I think I have heard the average for millennials will be six different careers or jobs or transitions that you will go through. So you have to. You have to reinvent yourself. And here, you can invent yourself and then get the tools to keep that reinvention going. So I am just really eager to get some questions in while we still have some time. And uh, thank you very much for listening. So how do we do this? Well, there will be hands popping up. <laughs> Anybody? Um, we could, I can talk about Michigan. I can talk about education. Or we can talk about Putin and Russia, whatever you would like. Mark? Uh, I'm very curious about your insights on the generation at MCOOC. Uh, you know, this uh, rise of a, a, a Russian identity that's not, you know, second string to Europe, that is, can stand on its own feet. Um, you know, we wouldn't have seen that 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your sort of read or prediction on how these, uh, this younger generation now in college or graduating college 
are sort of see themselves so is there as much of a, a yearning to travel abroad to like learn to so that they can leave uh, or does that you know national pride to extend to uh, broadly to stay in Russia well that's a, a great question, and I think it's a question that's actually kind of hard to answer. You probably followed the demonstrations, the protests that happened in Moscow, St. Petersburg, but also about 80, at least, 80 other cities in Russia just this past week. Um, I think if you put, I try to figure, okay, what have they been through? Soviet Union ended 25 years ago. And so this generation right now that's in college has never, ever experienced the Soviet Union. That's number one. And they actually, you could argue, have never had a president but Vladimir Putin. I mean, they had Medvedev.